the explanations I'm talking about are often termed cognitive science of religion, and uh, they're experiments testing people, and particularly children's, psychological tendencies. Uh, so, for example, there are experiments that indicate we're very prone to give personal explanations even for impersonal arrangements of dots. So the dots move around the screen and we describe in terms of some dots chasing others and we ascribe intention and purpose to inanimate things. And it seems that we're very prone to detecting agency purposes out there in the world and even uh, children ascribe to clouds they rain because they want to rain. The idea is that that might lead us to detect agents that aren't there but would explain events or things that seem important to us in terms of an invisible agent. Mm -hmm. And other experiments suggest that we find stories about invisible agents more memorable and are more likely to tell those stories on. So these ideas spread more than boring stories about things that are totally intuitive uh, and more than stories which are about things that are highly complicated or mm -hmm. abstract. So certain religious stories may fit the bill and spread very mm -hmm. easily. So you're talking about a sort of explanation for religious beliefs throughout the world, all cultures? All yes, so one, one of the goals would be to explain commonalities. Mm -hmm. For example, that belief in invisible spirits or a spirit is very common around the world. Uh, universally, cultures seem to be prone to have these stories about spirits, ancestor spirits, creator spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so commonalities, yeah. So um, the psychologists who've been carrying out these experiments and commenting on them, uh, is there agreement among them as to what these mean? Well, as with all science, uh, there has to be discussion and uh, disagreement to weed out the good from the, the bad, uh, but there, there is now talk of a standard model, so uh, people like Pascal Boyer, Scott Atron, uh, Paul, uh, Paul Bloom, uh, Justin Barrett, are seen as leading lights in a new and growing field, telling a similar sort of story with the same elements in it. Mm. So we're not dealing with some sort of settled no. Uh, results, but we are dealing with a, a recognisable mm. approach which mm. is generating new and interesting data. Yes, and what sort of implications do, the, do these experiments have for religious belief? Well, a lot of religious believers would appeal to their experience, and uh, you know, I find this in my work as a vicar that uh, someone appealed to a near accident that they had on the road and their car was spinning around, suddenly it was right and they felt that their mother had looked after them and he told it to me quite straight. So that sort of appeal to experience is, is part of the justification many people would give, the reasoning they give to support their religious belief. And if science can tell a story about why we might be prone to explain mm. the, you know, the strange result in terms of an agent, an invisible agent, the spirit of my ancestor, my mother, for example, then that scientific story might undermine the religious story if it's providing a better justified explanation for the same event. But uh, I would argue that belief in a creator God isn't undermined in the same way as belief in a spirit acting in the world because a creator God would have made the world such that we might be prone to believe in him. So there are implications if the scientific explanation can explain away our experience, but I would say that an account of the way we are doesn't explain away belief in a creator God because the way we are would be ultimately the result of the way the creator God made us and the rest of the world. But couldn't an atheist say that um, these experiments show that belief in God is a sort of childish tendency we have, and as we grow up we begin to think more logically and we develop more rational explanations. Yes, and, I, and I've heard atheists stressing that these are tendencies that we often have from our uh, youth, but what happens is we, we develop and gain a more sophisticated understanding of the world and of our religious beliefs. So 
it's not that we leave behind these tendencies, we mm. learn to use them and deploy them more carefully. And, and I would say it's the same in my religious beliefs, that you know, I would be uh, embarrassed if I still believed quite the same things about God now mm. as I did when I was young. And I probably did incline at mm. least to image God as a sort of man. I think he looked suspiciously like a vicar. But obviously uh, my thinking has advanced both scientifically and theologically but what this I think does suggest is that it's part of normal healthy human psychology mm -hmm. that we have these tools and we can see how these tools could make yes, religious beliefs yes. spread. You said one of the psychologists calls it um, intuitive theism. Yes, yes that's mm -hmm. yeah, which I, is sort I of a counter, counter argument to Dawkins view that children are brainwashed into religion. Yes I, th I think I think even Dawkins recognises now that mm. uh, you don't need to brainwash children to make them believe in God, though he would still say that the way you bring them up affects yes. how they uh, yes. articulate it and which religion they might follow. But yeah, I think it, it does get away from this mm. idea that religion is unnatural and forced mm. into people. Yes. It's more that it's natural and it naturally uh, arises, though it's hard to test that definitively because yes. to put children on yes. an island and isolate them <laughs> wouldn't be very ethical. No. Thank you very much. And, Thank you very much, Claire.